Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're watching this or what time you're watching this. My name is Terry Nielsen. I'm the worship leader at El Camino Grace Church in El Cajon, California, and I'd like to be the first one to welcome you to the streaming service that we're putting on today. We are thrilled that you are taking this time to join us. We hope you enjoy this, but most of all, we hope you are blessed. So we're going to start off with My Lighthouse. In my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You want the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you want the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions your truth will hold, your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. Thank you for tuning in to the service at El Camino Grace Church coming to you from El Cajon, California. This is part of the greater San Diego area, and we are thankful that you've tuned into this service. And we pray it'll be a great encouragement and a great blessing to you that are listening, whether you're here in our local community or whether you're across the United States or you're in some place like India or uh, even Spain or the Netherlands or wherever you might be. We pray for God's greatest blessing and strength for you. 
I want to read some words from a person that was not only in house confinement and told to stay at home, he was in a worse situation than that. He actually was in prison. And he was in prison for preaching the gospel of Christ. And it's the Apostle Paul. And he writes from prison. And you say, well, I, I'm, I don't think I could ever say that. Well, he did. And he had victory in spite of the difficult circumstances. He said in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. He's present. And then he goes on to say, writing from this prison, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then, this is a tremendous statement, and the peace of God, yes, even in the storms of life, even in the hard, difficult times, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and, and your minds through Christ Jesus. What fantastic words coming from a prison cell from the Apostle Paul. Let's look to God as we pray. Our loving Father in heaven, <clears throat> we come into your presence at this service to praise you, to worship you. You're the only true and living God. And we come into your presence knowing that you hear us and that you're listening and you're interested in the details of our lives. And Father, we know that there are many, many listening right now that are going through some terrifically difficult times physically. Some are going through some difficult times emotionally, some financially. Lord, we do pray that you'll meet their need and give them strength and peace in the midst of this storm of life. And then, our Father, we do pray for those that are leading our world and our nation, that you'll give them some divine wisdom in this uh, terrible situation with this virus. And then, Lord, we do pray for healing we pray also for those that have lost loved ones that you'll be with them in a very special way. And Lord, flood their minds and hearts with some wonderful truth from your word and the wonderful truth from their lives of, of their loved ones. And then, Father, we do pray for those that are suffering financially with loss of jobs and their businesses and Lord, we do pray that you will undertake for them in a very special way. Lord, we pray that everything in this service would bring honor to you, and we commit it to you. And we pray these things in that magnificent and powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. <clears throat> Several announcements. First of all, you'll notice online that there's an opportunity for communication. And I would encourage you to uh, communicate with us. If you have a prayer request, whatever it might be, please put that down. And uh, we will pray for you. We promise that. And then also, if you, at the end of this service, are making a decision to come back to the Lord and have a close walk with him, if you could write that down. And then if, if in this service the Lord speaks to you by the power of his spirit, to give your life to Christ and to invite Jesus Christ into your life, we would appreciate knowing that. Just put that down on the communication opportunity uh, that you find there online. And then... I have two basic requests for you. 
One is to pray. To pray for the situation around the world and to pray for this service. And to pray for your own heart and mind that it might be open to the word of God. So pray. Really make it a point to talk to God. <clears throat> the second request is to text, call on the phone, communicate in some way with some of your family, some of your friends, people you worked with in the past, whatever, some of your neighbors, and encourage them to actually watch the service. Invite them to watch the service. And when I say that, I want to remind you that it not only is at 8.30, it is also at 10.30, at 12.30, and then it's at 2.30, and then at 4.30. And if you happen to miss those opportunities, you still can go back by just putting in www.elcaminograce.org and then you're going to be able then to pick up a past service. So I encourage you to do that. And then just watch for future notice of coming events and when we'll be able to resume our service when we gather together. So thank you for listening to these announcements and they're very important. In 1886, a Swedish minister named Carl Boborg, inspired by the grandeur of a thunderstorm on the rugged coastline, wrote a poem beginning with the words, O Stor Gud, or O Mighty God. It was set to an old Swedish melody. Then in 1907, the text was translated into German. Later, in 1912, a Russian clergyman, I. S. Prokhanov, produced a translation which finally led in 1925 to a clergyman in Chicago who translated the Russian text into English. But this version, which began, Almighty God, when I behold the wonder, never achieved broad popularity. Stuart Hine, a British missionary in Russia in 1923, heard the Russian rendition of the hymn and was deeply moved. He decided to write an English version, adding his own thoughts and weaving into the text deep expressions of worship for the breathtaking scenery and the many conversions to Christ he had witnessed in his travels. He ended up with three verses, but this English version of the hymn, much like the later 1925 version, remained largely undiscovered. Years passed. During World War II, Reverend and Mrs. Hine returned to England, and immediately following the war, they observed the plight of refugees trying to return home. Thousands had fled to Britain from Eastern Europe during the Nazi invasion, and now were homesick, wanting to return to their native lands. Prompted by this, Hine wrote a fourth verse to the hymn that he translated years before. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. In 1949, the completed hymn was printed, inspired by the wonders of creation, the joys of salvation, and the horrors of war. It had evolved over 70 years from the pens of many authors, moving through four languages, Swedish, German, Russian, and English. But still, it was seldom sung. While in London, during the 1954 Billy Graham crusade there, George Beverly Shea was given a small four-page leaflet containing this hymn in both Russian and English. He played and sang it for himself, then shared it with other members of the Graham team. A year later, he tried it out in Toronto, and the response inspired him. Finally, three years from the time that he was first introduced to it, he premiered it fully at the great New York Crusade of 1957. 
There, George Beverly Shea sang this treasured hymn 93 times with the choir joining the chorus with these powerful words. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. We're going to ask the choir with George Beverly Shea to now sing for you one of our beloved hymns. It's a new hymn to American audiences but one we have found that people love wherever we go. The choir and Mr. Shea now sing for you, How Great Thou Art. We would like to take this time to ask you to invite you to join with us. We're going to start the worship, worship time now. We're going to have the words on, this, on the screen, and we just want you to just sit back and sing along with us. Oh Lord my God, when I am awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me, how great thou art.
say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as Oh 
Thank you, praise team. These are difficult days, and we all are making major adjustments. And of course, one of them is we can't meet together and assemble together as a church. And uh, even the praise team has to be minimal in size uh, because of the fact that we're limited uh, to the number of people that can even gather together to put this uh, service on and live stream or also on YouTube and also on Facebook, uh, you can watch this. But anyway, because of that, the expenses continue on. And I'm particularly speaking to our own congregation. And we just uh, would thank you very much from the depths of our hearts for your faithfulness in giving. And again, just a reminder that you can give uh, online or you can also uh, mail your check to the church office, which is 1150 Broadway, El Cajon, Suite 234, or you can also bring it by the church office Monday through Thursday. And we just pray that the Lord will continue to meet our need in a very special way as we still incur expenses in uh, actually continuing on with the live streaming and all that's involved uh, with that and then the, the general expenses of the church and carrying on. So thank you again. We don't want anybody to give just because of necessity, because of pressure. We want people to give of their tithes and their offerings because of their love for Christ, because the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. And I've learned long ago in life that it is actually more blessed to give than to receive. And Jesus was really right on that. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity of giving to your work, investing in people's lives, investing in that which is eternal. And Father, we do pray that each one of us might be very faithful wherever we might be, to our own church and giving faithfully to the Lord. And then we do pray for those in our own area that you will just lay it upon their heart to be very consistent and faithful in their giving to you. They're not giving to just an organization. They're giving to you as an act of worship, investing in people's lives and investing in that which is eternal. Bless both the gift and the giver. Multiply it, just as you multiplied the loaves and fishes, and uh, use it for your glory in the lives of people, that people might be uplifted and transformed by your wonderful gospel. And we ask these things in that name above every name, that strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem that day. The soldiers tried to clear the narrow. 
sorrows to eat. But the crowd pressed in to see the man condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating. There were stripes upon his back. And he wore a crown of thorns upon his head. And he bore with every step the scorn of those that cried out for his death. Down the Via Dolorosa, all the way of suffering, like a lamb came the Messiah, Christ the King. Tristed via in Jerusalem, los soldados le abrían paso a Jesús. Mas la gente se secaba para ver aquella va, aquella cruz. Por la vía dolorosa, es la vía de dolor. the Lord. That was amazing. That was uh, by special request. I have heard Rogina sing that song on different occasions, and I thought it was extremely fitting for what we're talking about. And I, it's uh, one of my favorite songs, and uh, thank you so much, Rogina, for singing that for us. And, and as you were singing that, I couldn't help but think of the Via Della Rosa, You've saw, probably seen it in movies, you've probably seen it in different places, but I imagine it and see it in my mind in Jerusalem, and I imagine the streets that he walked, and I remember the first time that I was in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, and for me, it was such a, an emotional moment to be on the Via Della Rosa, I know that the, the stones and the city is higher than it was originally, but we, we take the group down to that original stone level. 
and to be thinking about where Jesus drug that cross till he had no more strength. And then they had to get a, another man to get to take it for him. And I, I, I just, as, as I think about that moment, that time, that as he was dragging that. And for me, I was, as I was there in Jerusalem, it was really a very special moment. But everybody else was about their business. Everybody else was kind of, they were buying and selling and the shops were open. And, I, and it hit me because I first thought, why aren't you celebrating what happened right here? But then I thought, you know, on that day, the day that Jesus did drag that cross, I'm sure there was a lot of hustle and bustle, but right where he hung on that cross at Golgotha was a road and I'm sure it was just busy with people passing by. People wondering, what, what's that? What's going on here? Nah. <laughs> I guess they're crucifying somebody else. Because the Romans did that on a regular basis. And nobody stopped. It, it, I mean, pa- pastors by would have just not known what's going on. Maybe somebody told them, oh yeah, someone, you know, hey, that, that guy named Jesus is, is being crucified. But I think he didn't just do that, and he didn't just go to that cross, but he did that for me. He did that for me, to pay for my sin. And if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ today, he did that for you. And if you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to pay for your sins, at the end of this message, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray and trust in Christ To pay for your sins. He died on that cross for your sins. And for mine. But if he. If you haven't. He did it for you too. And he wants you to accept his payment. That he made. Because he loved you. He loved you then and he loves you now. And he wants to know you in a personal way. Let's go to the Lord as we. In a word of prayer. As we think of that sacrifice that he made. And we go to this word of prayer and ask him to bless the discussions that we're going to have today. Father, as we get into your word, as we sung the truths of your word, and we're getting into studying your word today, I, I pray that you don't just open our minds, even though we want that too. We also pray, and I pray right now, Lord, that you will open our hearts so that we will not only just understand who you are, understand what you've done, but that, you, that, that we will t- turn over our hearts to you and the very core of our being, that we will surrender it to you so that we can know the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, That came down as a man and was tortured and beaten and scourged so that that I could have a relationship with God. And, And not just beaten, but then hung on a cross to the point of death. And then three days later, on the third day, rose again so that I could have a relationship with you. And that I could know that my sins are completely forgiven. Lord, I, I, just, I just pray that, that me and any other person who's listening to this message today never gets over that. That we never just think, oh, that's, that's, um, yeah, that's the old stuff. <laughs> Lord, I, I, I always want to be in awe of what you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that I can go to you and any of us who know you can go to you at any moment of any day and pray to you for every concern and every trouble and every victory in life we can turn to you. We just thank you today for this. In Jesus' wonderful, holy, and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, the last couple of weeks, 
We have been studying in the, the last part of the book of James in chapter 5. And as we've been studying it, we've been asking the question, does God really care for me? Does God really care for you? Does God really care for what's going on in your life? Does God really care for how you're feeling and what you're going through? Does God really care about you? This world is filled with troubles. It's filled with all kinds of problems. From coronavirus to the common flu to the common cold to, to, to cancer to famine and disease and poverty. The world is filled with problems. Does God have enough on his plate that he doesn't need to care for you and for me? Or does he really care? Can he really care for those things but also care for the very things that are going on in each of our lives? And I'll tell you, God can care and does care for each of us. And the Bible makes it very clear, Jesus made it very clear that, and I've said this before, that that. He knows even the littlest detail, like how many hairs are on our head. He knows you. He knows things about you that you don't know about you. And He loves you. And He loves me. And as we think of uh, the, the strange times that we're in, never in a million years did I ever think that I would put on a mask and walk into a bank and ask for money. I mean, it's just, it, it, but we're required to right now. So it's, uh, it's just strange, strange times. So we're going to talk about, we're going to review do, do a little bit of a review right now. And like I said, we're working through the book of James. The book of James, of course, is about tests of living faith. Tests of living faith. And we're in the last section, the last section of chapter 5. And I'm going to read verses 13 through 18. Okay. And it says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain in the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heavens gave rain and the earth produced fruit. And so earlier in the series, we we were talking about, does God really care for me and you? Does God really care? And he shows us that he cares by, one, seeing our condition of needing him. That was our point number one. It says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? See, what what James is talking about is as we're going through the times of life where there are good times and our bad times, God cares for us and he sees our condition. The second thing that we learned was that he, God shows us that he cares by giving us a way to call on him. And for verse 14, it says, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And we talked about when you have something in your life that's so overwhelming, that's so big, so so terrible and and you, you just don't know that you don't want to handle it by yourself. You can't handle it by yourself. You come to other people, to other godly people, spiritual leaders and you you say, "Listen, I need a touch from God. I want you to pray for me. Please lay hands on me. Anoint me with oil." And the and 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 this is what the Lord asks us to do as a sign of his blessing saying pour out this blessing upon this brother or sister in Christ the third thing we said God really shows us that he cares by answering the prayers of faith and it says in verse 15 and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins he will be forgiven so God answers prayer. 
It will save the sick. It says it's a promise of God. He says the prayers of faith will save the sick and raise him up. So God says here that, that those prayers, that he's going to answer them. Now we're going to talk about that in a little while, how that, how that is affected by his will, but that's where we were. And then ver number four is that he helps us to see our barriers to our answered prayer. That not everything that we pray God answers, because sometimes we have barriers in our lives. And last week I talked about the fact and gave you a visual picture of the fact of the, of the bollards that come up out of the ground. That, that literally you can drive a truck in, and they do. I've seen on, uh, you can look at them online. I've seen video online of these trucks that, that they pull by wire and come into this thing 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. And it literally, these bollards, these, these round posts that pop up out of the ground, the, 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 a truck literally, it, go, the, it goes right into the truck. It creates a barrier into an embassy or some other building so that it says, no, unless you are authorized, you are not allowed in here. And, and that is how God works when it comes to prayer. He is not going to listen to, to somebody who has barriers, of the, uh, uh, barriers between them and God. And some of those barriers that we talked about were, first of all, sin and rebellion... The second barrier was a barrier of faith in the Lord. And then we're going to go further today, and we're going to talk about the third barrier, and that is God's greater purpose. God's greater purpose. Our barriers are the first two, like I said, sin and rebellion in our lives. Second, a lack of faith. And third, God's greater purpose. Now, here, notice what it says in Romans, in Romans chapter 8, verse 27 and 28. Some of you are very familiar with this passage. And here's what it says. It says, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. According to the will of God. Now notice that, underline that in your Bibles or in your outlines. I hope you have them. You can download them if you don't. But underline that according to the will of God. That everything in this universe is subject to the will of God. Now sometimes he allows things to happen that he doesn't necessarily want to happen, such as sin. But, he, but his nature is, is to also allow the freedom... And, and to allow us to make choices. And we have a free will to be able to sin and rebel against him. But everything is subject ultimately to God's will. And so as we think about this, then it says in verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to what? His purpose. His purpose. In other words, when we're called and we become Christians, when we follow the Lord, it's according to His purpose. Now those things in our lives will work together for good, but it's according to His purpose. We often cut that part of the verse out. Oh, you know, I've heard people quote to me and say, oh, you know, Pastor Dave, I know that everything works together for good to those who are called by God. And they stop there. But it's not, that's not the end of the verse. It's according to his purpose, his will. That's what we're subject to. So several weeks ago, uh, after this, this whole quarantine and social distancing and all of that started, uh, Joel and I, we, we, sometimes before we all go to bed, we'll, we'll, we'll throw on a movie. And, and so we decided we were kind of flipping through the different movies, that selections and we found Aladdin. And Aladdin, uh, I thought, well, you know, that, that looks interesting. We watched the preview. It looked entertaining by Disney. And I thought, well, this, this, looks, this looks interesting. So we turned it on. And I remember in there, and, and if you've seen it, you'll know, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, he comes across, Aladdin comes across the, the lamp, I think is what they call it. And, of course, then he gets the genie, and he gets three to ask the genie three different questions. And the genie has to perform and do whatever, he, whatever Aladdin wants him to do. 
And then the rest of the movie is, is about that. And, and so, of course, he has three wishes, and he tells him, well, listen, you can't ask for three more wishes. That was always a question when we were kids. Everybody said, well, if you had a genie uh, and, and gave you three wishes, what would you ask for? And the people always say, well, I'd ask for three more wishes so that I, I just keep adding them up, and then I get whatever I want. Well, the first thing he says is you can't ask for three more wishes. But as the movie went on, Aladdin could ask for anything he wanted, and, and I'm not going to tell you about the movie. You can go watch it yourself. But there are Christians who look at God like that genie in that lamp. Oh, I, 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 I can do anything I want in life. I can do anything I want, but I, I have that genie, and I can rub that lamp. The genie pops out, and my God is right there, and all I have to do is then I have to ask him, and he's subject to me to do whatever I need him to do. You see, God doesn't work that way. That's, God is not your genie in a, in, a, in a lamp. He's not your genie. He doesn't just perform at your will. One of the things that we have to understand is that God's greater purpose is on the line. That God does what he wants to do. He does what, he, what is in his best interest. And it, we, it, he acts according to his will, his desire. And according to his glory. You say, well, isn't that kind of selfish for God to, uh, to seek his own glory? No, not at all. God, what we do when we do, when he's talk about the genie, see, Aladdin was the boss, basically, of genie. He, he, the genie was submissive to Aladdin. But it's the other way around, isn't it? God is never submissive to me. I am submissive to him. It's not my will that matters. It's his will that matters. And it's his glory that he's after. And people often ask, well, isn't that kind of selfish that God is after his own glory? Let me just say that history, you've probably heard the statement, is his story. And in the picture of history, I am maybe a little tiny, tiny little piece of the mosaic that God is putting together. And it's a mosaic of love. It's a mosaic of his actions. It's a mosaic that brings him glory. I'm just a tiny little speck. And by myself and by ourselves, we, we, we don't have, we don't make the picture. God makes the picture. He has the bigger and greater view. And we have to understand that. I heard of a story some time ago, and it was that there was a, uh, a lady who got into her car. And she got into her car, and then all of a sudden, as she's driving down the street, there's this, this big semi-truck that's right on her bumper in the dark of the night. And as, it, as, as she's driving, she turns one way. The semi is right there. She turns another way. As she speeds up or slows down, the semi is following her every turn she makes. So she finally sees, uh, in the dark of night, she sees a convenience store. And she pulls up to that convenience store, slams on the brakes, throws it in park, hops out of the car and runs inside to get to the telephone. At that time, the semi-truck driver hops out of his truck, runs up to the car, and in the back seat, he opens the door and pulls an assailant out of the back seat so that he could, uh, he could uh, call the police and arrest him. You see, from his perspective, he saw what she didn't see, was somebody in her back seat on the floor that was going to maybe kill her, do other things. You see, in our lives, we've got to understand that God has the bigger picture. He's got his bigger picture. He's also got our lives' bigger picture. And he promises us, and he says, and all things work together for good to those who are called by God and who are called according to his, who love God and are called according to his purpose. God has the, uh, he's got the better view of our lives. 
He knows, the Bible says that God knows the end from the beginning. It doesn't say that he sees the beginning and then watches it to the end. God knows the end from the beginning. God knows your days. God knows how many days you, I have and you have. He knows how many are numbered. He knows everything about us. He even knows the future. And so from his perspective, it's according to his purpose, according to his will. And sometimes we want to ask God things that aren't necessarily according to his will. He's not our genie in the bottle. He's got a better, a better plan. And I mentioned a few minutes ago that people often say, well, is it selfish for God... Is it selfish for him to seek his own glory? And I say, no, of course not. He's the creator of heaven and earth. You see, when I seek glory, I seek glory and I, 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 that, that I don't necessarily deserve. But when God seeks glory, he created the universe. He created the hundred billion galaxies that they believe are out there. The stars that are, that are bigger than we can imagine. That are huge portions of our whole solar systems that are, that are you know, a million times the size of our sun. He created all of those stars and those solar systems. He created all of those things. Should he get glory? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, imagine it this way. If I, if I designed and made a car, every single piece, every single part of it, I, I, I designed the tires. I designed every part of that car. And I made it all by hand. And we go to a car show. And I, and I bring up my car. And I'm, I, it's ready to go. I'm going to show everybody this beautiful car that I've made. And Terry, who was up here a minute ago, right before I come out on stage, he pushes me aside. He locks my hands behind me. He, and, and, he, and he locks me in the back. And he hops out to the stage and says, listen, look at the beautiful car that I made. <laughs> well, first of all, you know I, I'd never make a car. But secondly, it's not right for him to take credit for what I've done. You see, it's not right for us to take credit for what God has done. God deserves the glory because he's created the universe. And that's a very important principle when we, when we look at this. And Jesus is the greatest demonstrator of this. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus went and he is, is, is sweating Sweating so profusely, it, blood was coming out from him. And he, was, and, and he was there laboring. The disciples were a close distance away. And, and they're hearing his, his travailing to the Lord. And he prays this prayer. He prays, this, if, Father, if this cup can pass from me. He says, if there's any way, if there's any other way. Than, being, than taking upon me the sins of the world but he says this and this is what we need to pray but not my will but yours be done what a what a powerful demonstration people say well that shows that jesus wasn't necessarily uh that he wasn't necessarily god well jesus did a lot of things to demonstrate, it didn't, didn't make him less God. Maybe we don't fully understand the interactions there. But, but he also was fully God but fully man. And in his humanity, he, he, he was, didn't want to go through what he had to go through. And in his spirit, in his relationship with God, he didn't want to have to go through taking on the sins of the world. The trouble that, he, that, 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 that brought upon his heart. And even the separation of the relationship temporarily that he would take on because of that sin. He was travailing about that. But the most important thing that I think we learn from that is that as he was doing that, he was submissive to God's will. In your trials, in your, in the, in the, in your difficulties that you're in right now, or in your life, are you willing to say, not my will, God, but yours be done? Because, God, I trust you enough 
not to just make me go around every trial. I trust you enough to bring me through that trial. I trust you enough that it's not what I want, it's what you want that matters. Because in that, you can have a greater, a greater glory in my life. I think of the I think of my friend. I have a friend in, in North India. His name is Chris. An Indian, Indian man. And he, he's, I've talked about him before, but he was in, he was in uh, both Bhutan and Nepal and is in prison. And, and you go, how, how does that bring God glory where he's trying to preach the gospel, he's trying to lead people to Jesus so they would have a salvation, and they take him and they throw him in prison. They beat him, and finally they, they, they threw him out. Of, of the Bhutan prison. And later on, he got thrown out of the, out of the uh, Nepal prison. And you go, how does that bring God glory? Well, while he was in prison, he led dozens and dozens and dozens of people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That nobody else could have reached those people. And someday, we'll see those people in heaven because Chris went to the prison. Sometimes, we go through a trial that we don't understand. Why? Because God has a greater purpose in it. Sometimes God wants to get glory through that. Even through healing or even through other, other means. God has a greater purpose and a greater benefit. And sometimes he wants to show us that he loves us even though we're going through that trial. I remember some years ago. My daughter Rachel... My daughter Rachel, we were up in Utah, and she woke up in the morning, and we're, and she shows us this bite that's this this sore that's on her leg that she got overnight. It was a spider bite. We tried to look through her bed and look around the bed and under the bed to try to find what kind of spider it was, but as it got worse and worse and it got hot and 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 as it got worse and worse. We thought, we better get her to the doctor. And so we, we called the doctor, rushed her in, got over to the doctor. And as the doctor was examining her, and, and I, was there, I was there with her. And she was, she was, I don't know, maybe four or five or six years old. And as the doctor was examining her, she says, listen, I don't know what kind of spider this is, but it's obviously progressing fast, could create infection, could create all kinds of problems so I need to give her a shot to help her. I don't even know what was in the shot. I just trusted the doctor. And so the doctor says, listen, I, I, I'm going to give her this shot. And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, okay, great. <laughs> this is going to be exciting for her to have this, this big, nice, big, long needle and whatever was in there. And I, I could just see Rachel's eyes were as big as saucers going, ah, uh, no, <laughs> she doesn't like shots even to this very day. And many of you don't, and, and so she starts screaming and crying. And here I am, I'm, I'm crying way worse than she is. And my heart is just broken because I'm seeing my daughter that I love so much. As she's, as she's just wailing, afraid of the needle, and then it goes in, and then she cries even louder. And my heart is breaking, I'm weeping. And as much as, as I was weeping, as much sorrow as I had at that moment, why did I let my daughter have to go through that suffering of that needle? Because I knew that she that it was going to be a greater good in her life if she took that shot. That it could absolutely help her. I, we don't know what could have caused, but there's spiders. It could have been a brown recluse, or a, it could have been a, a black widow, or some other spider that, that could have had detrimental effect on her, even killed her. And I'm not willing that my daughter would have have health damages for the long term, or or even die because of not taking the shot. So I'm willing to have the short term pain in her life because I love her that much. You see, I trusted that doctor, and I needed Rachel to trust me. And often we're in the harms of God, and he's allowing us to go through something. Because he has so much love for us. 
that there's something else that he's wanting to make sure doesn't happen in our lives. Maybe you're out there today, and as you're listening, you're going through a trial. Maybe it's a health problem, maybe a financial problem with a financial collapse. Whatever the case may be, I want, you to tell, I want to tell you something, that God cares a lot more about your eternal soul than he does your temporary body. He cares a lot more about, about your, uh, your eternal state than he does about your temporary circumstances. He would rather see short-term pain in your life than see long-term worse things. He would rather see you have a relationship with him and end up in heaven instead of hell. He loves you that much. That he's willing to let you go through such things. Because he loves you. It might not seem like love, just like it didn't for Rachel at the time. It didn't seem like I loved her. But it was because I loved her that I let her take that shot. My friend, the barriers to God answering our prayer are first sin and rebellion in our lives and lack of faith. The third thing is God has a greater purpose than ours. And we try to put ourselves as the, as, as the master of God and should be the other way around. God is our master and we need to bow before him and say, not my will but yours be done. The, third, the fourth thing is this. Our barriers are we live in a corruptible body. This is just a reality. I think back, I see my kids and they're, they're in their, uh, well, I've, I've got a, a teenager and then I've got most of the rest of them are in their 20s and I think I remember when I was in my 20s and I could run faster, jump higher, I was skinnier, I was, I was a lot more fit, I could go out and play sports, I could ride a bike for, for mile upon mile, I could do all kinds of things and I'm thinking that isn't the case anymore. Maybe, maybe you can identify with that. Our, our, our bodies are corruptible. And, and we need to understand that God has a purpose even in that. That while we are on, are on this earth, that as we, as we find ourselves deteriorating through life, as we find ourselves in that, we've got to take on. If we're going to spend, we, we don't spend eternity in these bodies the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 and 54. Let me read it to you. You have it in your outlines. It will be on the screen. For this corruptible, that means this body right here. For this corruptible body, this corruptible must put on incorruption. In order for us to spend eternity in heaven with God, we've got to put on incorruption. And part of that is a decaying of this body over time. No matter what health story you go to. And this mortal must put on immortality. If you're going to spend eternity with God, you've got to put on immortality. But you can't do it in this body. So then when this corruptible, again this body, has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory, in other words, when this corruptible body puts on incorruption, then the saying will be, death has been swallowed up in victory. I've had victory over death. Because why? Now I have an incorruptible body in heaven that I, that's not going to die, and I'm going to spend eternity with God. That's the, that's the point that he's making. We put on we have corruptible bodies. We begin a death process from the time we're born. And however many years the Lord allows us and grants us here, years of joy and love and friendship and relationships, every single one of us will pass away. If there's anybody who doesn't recognize that, they're being completely foolish. Everybody knows. Everybody sees it around them. We go to funerals. We see even superstars and movie stars all pass away. It doesn't matter what their status of life, and it doesn't matter what yours is, and it doesn't matter what mine is. We all pass away. That's part of this corruption. And God is not going to 
He's not going to reverse that. He can prolong it. He can prolong somebody's life. But the inevitable will still happen. And so when somebody's, somebody's uh, up in years and, it's, and, and he, it, their designated time has come, God will take them home and bring them home. And that's the way that it works. And we have a time while we're here to make that decision. Now the last part that God shows us that he really cares, God shows us that he really does care by lastly revealing whose prayers he will answer. Notice what it says here. James then goes into this. He says, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, accomplishes much. Now what does he mean, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man? First of all, the Bible says that there are none, no, none righteous. No, not even one. Not, not me, not you. None of us are righteous before God. We're all sinners before God. But how can we then be righteous? If God only answers the prayer of a righteous man, how can we pray to God? Yeah, great, Pastor Dave. You just told me through the last couple of weeks that God really cares. God answers prayer. And now you're telling me that God only answers the prayers of righteous people. And then the Bible says that none are righteous. You're right. In and of ourselves, we aren't righteous. In and of ourselves, we are not righteous. None of us are. That's the point of Christ. That's the point of the cross. That's the reason that he died. So that he could remove that unrighteous barrier between us and God. And then he tells us to come boldly before the throne. What does that mean when I say boldly? The Bible tells us come boldly before the throne of God when we pray. What does that mean? It means ask for big things. That we can ask God, and, 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 and God will do great things in our lives when we ask Him. That's what it means. And so notice what it says. We are only made how, righteous by how? By Christ. But here, so, so notice this. It says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. What does it mean when it says effective, fervent? The word, the word here is most of the time is, is translated as work, as energy, or work. That's what it means. So think about this as, as, it, as it's saying the hard working, the, the, that's what it's saying, the effective, hard working, fervent, the, that word is translated kind of a, as a passionate. Not, not, a, not, not a prayer that goes, oh, you know, God, I want you to accomplish this. We're walking down the street. Oh, yeah, yeah, God, Lord, just accomplish that. Okay, God, just accomplish this. Oh, yeah, no big deal. No, no, no. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous, a, a hardworking prayer. When you're travailing before the Lord, you're on your knees, you're begging of God. The effective, the passionate, the hardworking prayer of a righteous man avails much. That's what it says. That's what he's talking about. Now I'm going to, we're going to get this last part. I'm going to cover a little bit of that next week. Because we have a special message that I'm going to have part of the message. And then my dad is going to have part of a message too. So I want, but, but this last part is an illustration and I want to get there. And I want to get there because, I, at this, because it's going to be a prelude for what we're going to talk about. Next week, and he uses an illustration of Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, that James says. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth proclaimed its fruit. I'm going to end with this section. But here's what I want to say. He says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Somebody not righteous, self-righteous in and of themselves. But humble before God, accepting Christ. Humble before God, coming before God boldly, asking for bold things. The righteous man who comes passionately before God can accomplish great things. That's what he's talking about. And then he gives an illustration. 
And the illustration that he gives is Elijah. And he, and, and he starts out with the story with Elijah, and he says, says this. We're going to cover this in greater detail next week. He says this, he says, he goes, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. In other words, he was flesh and blood, just like you, just like me. We, we tend to put a crown on these people, a halo on these people, say, oh, they were super spiritual people. No, he was just like you and me. He had the same hurts, the same fears, the same, the same desires. He, 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 you know, he got hungry. There was, he, was, he was a man just like you and me. But when he prayed, God literally stopped it from raining in the whole region because he prayed in the power of God, at the will of God, he prayed, Lord, stop it from raining until I say so again in your will. And the rain stopped and there was famine because Elijah prayed. For three and a half years, there was no rain. Until Elijah said, okay, let's let it rain again. To get Ahab, the king, to, to acquiesce, to come back to God. That's what he was trying to do. It was powerful. So what's God telling you today? God's saying to you that he cares for you and he cares for me. That he loves you. And he ends with this story after talking about prayer for a very specific purpose. That if God can, through the prayer of a man, stop the rain for three and a half years, do you think he can answer your problems and mine? Do you think he can help you? Do you think he listens to you? Not by your own strength, not by your own righteousness, by, but, but by the righteousness of Christ. God has the power to accomplish miracles in your life and mine. God is still in the business. There's nothing that we can't put God in a box. God can do whatever he wants according to his will. But God can accomplish great things if you'll ask him. And in a moment, I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. The first part of the prayer is going to be that you, that, that you would accept and humbly come before Christ so that you can be righteous, so that you can have your sins washed away. But the second part of the prayer is I'm going to ask you, whatever need you have in your life, I'm going to ask you to boldly ask God. Because God still does great things. He hasn't limited His power lately. He hasn't given it away. He still has it. He's still on the throne. Love the song that my friend M.A. Thomas used to sing. God is still on the throne and he will remember his own. The trials may press you. The struggles depress you. But God is still on the throne. God is still on his throne. And he's still able to help you and help me in our lives at our times of need. He cares for you. He loves you. He has a greater purpose for you. And if we will bow our head before Him and bow our knees before Him and call out to Him in faith, God can do whatever He wants. According to His will, He can do what we need Him to do when we call out to Him. In a few minutes, we're going to sing. The praise team's going to come back up and we're going to sing a song. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. But let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And let's, let's go to him and ask him right now. The first thing I'm going to say in this prayer is, is Lord, I, I want to remove the barriers of sin. And I want to become righteous before you. Not self-righteous, but righteous because of Christ. Washing me of my sins and having him forgive you of your sins by your faith in Christ and what he did on the cross. The second thing that, we, that we, we need to make sure that there's no sin barriers in our lives, even if we're our believers, that, that we're, we're not creating sin barriers in our lives. The third thing that we're going to do is we're going to ask and make our request clear to God. And I'm going to ask you to pray wherever you are. I'm going to ask you to pray out loud and ask God for whatever you need today, the touch that you need. And I want you to do that. So here, we're going to pray right now. Bow your heads wherever you are. Pray, that, pray with me, quietly or out loud, but since you're in your own homes, even with your family, just pray out loud with me. 
I'm just going to ask you to pray with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I need you right now. I believe, just pray right after me, I believe that you love me. I believe that you really do care for me. And Lord, right now, I also want to, I also know that I'm a sinner and I've sinned in my life. And I ask you to wash me of that sin and to forgive me based upon what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary when he died for my sins on the cross. And on the third day he rose again. Lord, I believe that. And I right now ask you for a miracle in my life. I ask you to work in a powerful way in this area that I need. And I I don't know what that is. You know what that is. But if you need a touch from God, you've got to ask him. You've got to tell him, you say, that because when he answers that, you'll know that he did it. So, so right, you say, right now, Lord, I need you to do this. I need you right now. And proclaim it out loud, what you are asking God today. If you are alone or if you're with your family, say, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to heal me. Or I'm, I'm asking you because I, I, I have this huge need in my life. Lord, I'm asking you, will you please do this for me? Proclaim it to the Lord. And call out to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you right now. And when you do this great thing, I will proclaim it for your glory. Father, I just pray that as there's people out there, first of all, I pray that they've put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ the only one who can die, who has died for our sins, who can wash us of our sins. And if you're out there today, that's your first step is a relationship with God. But the second is that if you have a need in your life and you're struggling in some area of your life, God does love you. He does care for you. And he wants to show you something great that he can do because he cares for your needs. I'm going to have the praise team come, and we're going to sing this song. And I just want you to listen to this song. I want you to bow your, your head before the Lord. Close your eyes. And as, this, as they're singing this song, I want you to make this the prayer of your heart. Lord, I need you. That's what they're going to sing.
temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. as you were praying and singing that song that it was a prayer of your heart that it was a prayer that you were saying literally to God God I need you you know there's a time in your life when you come to a place where you can't answer all the questions you come to a place where you can't there's nowhere else to turn where you need the touch from God where you need him in your life there's a time where, where, where all the other times in your life may have, you, it may have seemed even self-sufficient. But there comes a point in, your, in the midst of your trials that you say, okay, <laughs> I did my, li my, my life my way, but now I need God. Now I need you, Lord. You've shown me that I need you. And that's the time where God allows you to call out to him. Because like I said, he cares a lot more about our eternal souls than our temporary comfort. God loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you and for me. Like Regina sang earlier down the Via Della Rosa. What an incredible God. And we are not in the, we are in the days, just like that ending verse, we're going to sing a song that we sang last week too, but it's just a great, fun song, a beautiful song to the Lord. It's called Days of Elijah. You know, we are in some strange times. That <laughs> Some weird things. I, I, I never thought I'd see the day where, where the sin had overtaken our country the way that it had, has. But let me just tell you, I just pray that this is the time where God is using this I'm not saying God caused it, but God is allowing it to call people back to himself, to shake our very foundations so that we'll look to him for the solutions of our lives. Let's sing this song together. These are the days of Elijah, okay? All right, and we're going to conclude with this song. God bless you. I miss each one of you that, I, that, are, that attend here and, and locally. I just miss you so much. And I'll look forward to seeing, from, seeing you soon. And Lord willing in his time. Stay healthy. Continue to grow stronger in the Lord. God bless you and we love you. All right. Goodbye.
these are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trial, of famine and darkness and sorrow, Still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on a cloud, shining like the sun, at the trumpet's call. Jubilee, and out of Zion's hillside. 